Watering should be simple, right? But it's one area of gardening that often causes the most confusion. Hi, I'm Ben, and I'd like to show you a few rookie mistakes when it comes to watering and what you should be doing instead. Get it right, and you'll save yourself precious time, money, and of course, water, and all while growing beautifully healthy crops. Every gardener has been guilty of over or under watering from time to time, whether it's because we just want to be on the safe side or we simply forget. So how can you tell the difference? Well, the symptoms of under or over watering often look very much the same. It could be drooping or curling leaves and an often very sorry looking appearance. So here's how to tell the difference. First of all, think about the conditions. If it's sunny and hot and you've been away for a few days, your plants, well, they're probably gasping. But if it's cloudy and cool and you're rather keen with the watering can, they're probably drowning. Second, look at the plant itself. Here's a great example of a plant that's really healthy and turgid. It's got lovely dark green leaves. This isn't wanting for water. It's in great condition. And if we take a look at this apple mint here, we can see it's clearly struggling for water. It's limp. It's just looking very sorry for itself. Now, the best way to rehydrate a plant when it gets to this point is to drop it into a reservoir of water so it can take up what it needs from below and then just water the top as well to give it all a bit of a head start. We'll check back on this in a couple of hours to see how it does. Now, a little word about this actually, this is growing in terracotta and terracotta wicks away the moisture quite quickly, which does make plants grown in terracotta more prone to drying out. Sometimes you'll also find that the potting mix shrinks away from the edge of the pot as it dries out. This is especially the case with uh, soil-based potting mixes. The best way to hydrate things when they get to that point, shrinking away from the side of the pot, is to use this watering from below method so it can take an hour or two to really recharge itself and get back to full fettel. So a couple of ways you can test how moist the potting mix is that your plants are growing in. First is the finger test. Put a finger down about a, an inch or a couple of inches down to where the roots are and feel. If it's cool and moist, you know it's nice and damp and you don't need to bother. But if it's dry and dusty, you may well need to water. This does feel quite dry and dusty, but I know the roots go down quite a long way. So I'm going to also do the second test, which is to check for weight. It's quite heavy, so I know there's quite a bit of water further down, so I won't be watering this. You can do this with all sorts of pots, pick them up and with experience you can tell how much moisture they contain. I can also just test larger pots simply by pushing them with my foot to feel resistance for how heavy that pot is. Now common reasons for um, underwatering are simply skimming over the soil surface so it looks wet on the surface of it but just a few inches down it's completely dust dry. So again do the finger test to check. If you are growing in pots, do bear in mind, of course, that the bigger the container, the more potting mix it has and the more resources the plant has to draw on. So you'll probably need to water a little less often. But again, do check by pushing or lifting the container to gauge how heavy it is and then water appropriately. There are other things, of course, such as uh, the temperature, how windy it is and how much direct sunshine the plants get that will all have an effect on how quickly the moisture is exhausted and how frequently you'll need to water. Closely related to how much water we give our plants is how we actually apply it. Is your watering style decidedly uncool? Well, let's smarten you up and get you on point. Now, the first thing to do when your soil is really quite dry is to water it thoroughly. I take a very methodical approach. I go from bed to bed. I really, really water it, make sure it's nice, nice and wet, and then I move on to the next bed. And I go all the way around the garden, and when I've finished, I start all over again. Now, why do I do that? Well, the first soaking helps to wet the surface and get it nice and receptive for the second soaking. So when I come back round, it's already wet, and the next lot of water goes that much deeper. By watering really, really thoroughly like this, I have to water a lot less often. Usually just about once a week in a typical weather, and maybe twice a week when it's very hot and very sunny at the height of summer. Obviously, if you're in a hotter climate, you may need to water a little more often than that. If possible, 
aim the water towards the base of the plant so you're not wetting the leaves. Wet leaves are basically a waste of water because there's going to be more evaporation from that area. It's not the end of the world of course and can't be avoided but where you can aim it down. This is where of course ground level irrigation really comes into its own. Things like drip irrigation and soaker hoses that deliver water exactly where it's needed at ground level near the roots. I like to water by hand because it gives me a chance to get up close and personal with my plants and inspect them just for any signs of uh, problems that might be occurring. And also for bigger plants like these potatoes, tomatoes and corn say, it means I can concentrate on getting the head of the hose pipe there right in down among the foliage so I'm not wetting the leaves. And that's really important for disease prone plants like potatoes and tomatoes because you don't want to be wetting the leaves because that makes them more prone to diseases like blight. Now of course you can't help wetting the leaves and foliage of um, seedlings and smaller plants, that's absolutely fine. Just try to avoid wetting the leaves of these more uh, vulnerable plants. And then there's plant type and stage of life to consider. Not all crops need to be given the same amount of water. Seedlings and shallow rooted crops like beans will probably need watering more often than those with deeper roots like say carrots or, or chard which has a long tap root. So bear that in mind. Larger plants producing juicier, fleshier fruits will of course need more water too. I'm thinking the likes of cucumbers, tomatoes, squashes and of course zucchini or courgettes. And a more consistent water regime will avoid problems with things like a split or cracking fruits or as here a bit of blossom end rot. Basically more water in means more fruits out. It's tempting to water in the middle of the day. After all, that's when plants will be at their hottest and probably their thirstiest, right? Well, I'm afraid you're wrong. The best time to water is actually in the morning before the heat of the day. Now, watering in the morning is great because it charges up the soil moisture, setting plants up for the day so they've got plenty of resources to draw on and that'll keep them going uh, when it's much hotter during the day. Watering in the morning is actually quite a nice thing to do. It's a great way to start the day, perhaps with a coffee in hand, wandering around your plants and communing with nature. It's a great way to psych yourself up for the day. But look, I know not everyone's a morning person. Perhaps you prefer to start your morning just sprawled out on the sofa with your coffee, watching your favourite YouTube channel, for example. The next best time of the day in that case is to water later in the afternoon or early evening. There's still a bit of time for the soil to dry out before it gets dark. And it's good if the soil does dry out on the surface because it reduces the chances of um, soil borne pests like slugs and diseases. So watering in the evening is great, but look, if your plants are wilting at any time of day and it's a matter of urgency, don't worry about getting it right. Just get on and water, no matter what time of the day it is. This is probably where having an automatic irrigation system really comes into its own because you can set it on a timer to water at the optimal time of day. Rainwater is better to use for watering your plants than treated mains or city water. Mains water tends to be treated with chlorine, which gives it a slightly higher alkaline content, which is a definite no-no for acid-loving plants like blueberries. Rainwater, of course, is free, and that can be quite a big, important factor in places that are water-stressed and where water is more expensive. Now, my rain barrel here comes off this outbuilding. It's got quite a large roof. So when it's empty and we get a good rainstorm, it can recharge from empty to full in one go. Ideally, I'd like to connect another barrel up here to get twice as much water or even install an IEBC at some point. It's in a lovely shady part of the garden, so it's nice and cool. Lovely, cooling, clear water, perfect for those veggies and fruits. If your water has got algae in it, you can still use it to water your plants. Just use it on parts of the plant that won't be harvested. And then there's this water barrel here, which comes off my greenhouse roof. Just imagine how much water we'd be collecting though, if we had barrels coming off a house roof. You get loads of water, so maximise what you're harvesting. 
Now a little word about collecting water in some states of the United States. There are some restrictions applying when you're collecting lots and lots of water with a, a really big system. But generally, collecting water for garden use in small quantities like this is absolutely fine. But do check first local restrictions. For more on harvesting rainwater, do check out our video on that and I will pop a link to that down below. I can hardly be said to be living in a hot, searing climate, and the rain we get here is pretty consistent. But what this chart here doesn't show you is we can go surprisingly long periods without a drop of rain, three or even four weeks in some cases. Now we're entering into a dry period here, and that combined with quite strong sunshine that's due to get into the early 90s or, or low 30s Celsius means that soil can quickly go dust dry and rock hard. The best way to avoid that is to mulch, and a lot of us forget to do that. Now, you wouldn't go out into the midday sun without wearing, say, sunscreen, and the same applies to our soil. Shallow-rooted crops especially appreciate a good mulch, because their roots haven't obviously got that far to go down, and they're all at the surface. It keeps them cooler. And don't forget you can use mulches around container crops too. Also, don't forget the use of shade cloth, which is really valuable in hot climates for cool season crops and salads. Now, if you can, do uh, try and use organic mulches because as they rot down, they will feed the soil and the plants you're growing in it. So it's a bonus natural organic fertilizer. You can use anything that's to hand. I really like using dried grass clippings because I've got a lawn and there's plenty of these clippings available so it's a free resource. I've also used straw really effectively for mulching things like tomatoes. Other really good mulches are just regular garden compost that you've made. Pine needles make a great mulch or for bigger plants like fruit trees and bushes and so on you could use bark chippings. The purpose of mulch is is to lock in any moisture that you apply to the soil and so you want to get the soil nice and wet before you apply your mulch. It also um, just keeps it nice and cool and shaded, the soil that is, which is great for the earthworms and all the microbial life that's in the soil and uh, it stops it kind of getting blown away by the wind. You've seen all those horrific images of dust storms and all the soil getting blown off and all that topsoil escaping, well a mulch would prevent that. Remember that mint from earlier on? Well, look how quickly it's recovered. This is about two hours later. It really does recover quite speedily once you get it in the water. How do you make the most of the water that you use around the garden? Please do share all of your tips and ideas in the comments below. At this point, I'd like to thank all of our followers for all of your comments and all of your interaction with the channel. It really helps this channel out so that it gets promoted and even more people can learn about the joys of growing their own delicious fruits and vegetables. Next week, we're all bees, butterflies and blooms as we bring you our pollinator special. What can you do to help these valuable gardening allies? And what are the implications if you don't? Well, tune in next week to find out or check your subscribed and have turned on those notifications so we can let you know once it's ready. Keep cool out there, happy gardening, and I will catch you next time.